Welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation's Ask the Experts, a spotlight on non-epileptic events. My name is Patty Osborne Schaefer. I'm Associate Editor and Community Manager of Epilepsy.com. I'm also an Epilepsy Nurse Specialist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm joined by two of my favorite speakers, Dr. Salim ben Badis, Professor of Neurology and Director of Epilepsy at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Also, Dr. Lorna Myers, a clinical psychologist and director of the PNES program at the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group in New York and New Jersey. This is the last of three sessions where we've talked about non-epileptic events. Now, this topic, you know, generates lots of questions for people, all the way from what is, uh, what are non-epileptic events or seizures, how are they treated, but also, more importantly, what do I do if I should have one? This session will talk about just managing some of these non-epileptic events and then how to talk about it. We hope that we'll be having more of these sessions to address some specific questions that you may have in the future. A critical issue that people have is, well, regardless of the cause, you know, what do I do when one of these happens? So, you know, and I'm going to... Um, give a couple different scenarios or questions to that. For example, does someone need to have medical attention if they lose consciousness? Um, how long would, do they, do they call the doctor if they lose consciousness and injure themselves? Should they go to the emergency room? Is there ever a period, of, a length of time that they should seek medical attention or not? So, um, Salim, let me turn this one to you. I know it's a very individualized one, but we also need to have some general parameters to share with people. These are individual uh, situations, but there are some general rules which are essentially the same, whether the seizures are psychogenic or epileptic. Uh, if the seizures are unusually severe or unusually prolonged for this particular patient, or obviously they cause injury, then the patient should be brought to the emergency room or the family should call 911. Um, these are the same rules as epilepsy, really, whereas if the seizures are the usual for this particular patient, simple observation, let the patient come out of it and calling the physician to notify them would be sufficient. So based on that, I think every person who has events or seizures, whether they're epilepsy or non-epilepsy, should have what we call a, a seizure response or action plan to talk about, you know, that will very simply say, what are they? what do you do and when to seek emergency help so people don't get over-treated or under-treated. That's exactly right and those treatment plans or strat strategic plans should be of course individualized with the physician that knows the patient fairly well because they are very individual as you say but when in doubt it's always better to either go to the emergency room or at the very least call the physician describe what happened and don't forget now with the use of cell phones you can video uh, the episodes, if there is any doubt about what they are, I can tell you as a, as a epilepsy specialist, it is very helpful when patients bring me the video on the cell phone of what happened. Are there things that you might uh, teach patients about what they can do when an event occurs? So they would develop that as part of their seizure response. Well, uh, with regards to uh, a seizure response plan, um, I often recommend that patients either wear a medic alert bracelet that says um, either dissociative seizures or conversion disorder, now that term has been changed, um, also to carry around a card, a laminated card that describes their typical episode. Uh, that has uh, emergency contact uh, information and so forth. Uh, one of the main problems that patients with PNES report is that uh, they are too often taken to uh, emergency rooms uh, and uh, even when uh, it is not necessary or when they've tried to explain that it's not necessary, they are uh, still, um, the ambulance is still called and they are still taken there. Uh, then there's a whole set of other problems that arise um, where the patient, uh, one, will often feel that they are um, not treated with as much respect in the emergency room because what they are having is a psychogenic episode and then they also receive huge bills um, afterwards uh, from that emergency visit. Um, so typically what I would say is unless there's been an injury or unless like uh, Salim was saying, unless there's something that seems very unusual, um, 
I would uh, recommend for the most part that uh, patients educate those around them and that they have all of this literature with them and um, that they try to, uh, to avoid uh, the emergency room if at all possible, if that seems to make sense. Yes, that does make a lot of sense. And I think that's, that's a huge question. I'm glad you raised the thing about the extra bills that people concur. Mm -hmm. that, that's a big prob a huge problem for many people. So in addition to just finding the right form of treatment and knowing how to respond to treatment, a lot of people are saying, now what happens when I have these and I'm out in the community? So a specific one someone wrote in is, what are some recommendations to help students in schools if they are having the uh, psychogenic events? What should teachers or school nurses do? Essentially, like the question about the emergency room, the response should be the same, whether it is epileptic or psychogenic. You, first of all, you don't panic, and you make sure other people don't panic, but this is true for epileptic seizures too. You make sure the patient is comfortable and is not at risk of injuring themselves, and you let the seizure end. Psychogenic seizures, like epileptic seizures, will end on their own 99% of the time within just a few minutes. So no fingers in the mouth, no heroic measures, reassure people, the environment, don't let people panic and go crazy, things will settle down and then you have them call the doctor for a more long-term plan. The, the rules are not different for psychogenic seizures versus epileptic seizures in this situation. Okay, and Lorna, do you have other thoughts for, for students with seizures or for families? I would say with students, and, and I am more of a specialist with adults, uh, but I have seen uh, adolescents, and I would say that the main thing is you're really going to be working with a team. Um, so the school is going to be part of that team. Uh, you will need to educate uh, all of the important um, educational staff. Um, you'll be working with your mental health uh, team as well. Uh, there will also be the need to use uh, any accommodations that the school offers. Um, if they offer them, if they offer resources, you need to educate yourself about that and to uh, use whatever is available. Um, there may be other issues, um, including learning disabilities or attention deficit, um, disorder. Uh, so you will want to also have a neuropsychological test on board. Um, and so there's really an entire team that is working with the family and with the child um, to ensure that the child is safe uh, but is also able to uh, resume uh, their activities in school as soon as possible. Uh, there's education, obviously, of the um, of the educational staff uh, as to uh, one maintaining the safety of the child, but two not uh, going overboard and to allow uh, the child to do as much as they can um, within within uh, the limitations that they may have uh, at the time of the diagnosis. So you. Uh both stress some, some excellent points of, of what people need for, for treatment. Yet we also talked earlier about how it's difficult to find treatment. So uh, how this I need some practical guidance from both of you, a few tips from each of you. How can we help how can someone find a good medical team who knows how to and is willing to treat people with PNES? So Salim, you can take it and then Lorna. I can take it and rapidly give it to Lorna, who has a much better answer than I do. Unfortunately, we, the neurologists, e even a center like where I work, where, again, 30% of patients have psychogenic seizures, so we see a ton, and I'm interested in this, so people send me a lot of patients, and I still don't have a particular uh, systematic setup to see those patients at treatment. But Lorna is putting together a database of practitioners, mental health practitioners, that are willing and able to help and so that's a wonderful uh, source that she just put together and I'm starting to use that but hopefully it will grow. Lorna, I'll let you expand on this. So there are a few resources that are available and hopefully there will be many more uh, over the next few years. Uh, one of them is a um, link uh, to my website. It's called www.nonepilepticseizures.com uh, where we have been uh, slowly collecting a list of uh, mental health professionals who know about PNES and who are interested in working with PNES. We have uh, 12 states 
represented so far and uh, the goal will be to have all 50 at some point um, and those are uh, professionals that can be contacted and who are uh, familiar and interested in working with PNES. Uh, for those people who live in states that are not among those 12, uh, what I sometimes recommend is to go to the American Psychological Association uh, website um, where they have a psychologist locator. Um, this is not the best option, but uh, there is a uh, the psychologist locator with the option of dissociative disorders, um, and you can look by your zip code, and uh, you can look uh, for a psychologist who specializes in dissociative disorders, which is close enough uh, to PNES. Um, other than that, uh, there are a few large centers um, where there are. Um, uh, staff on board. Uh, ours is one of them, but there are now a growing number of, uh, of centers where uh, there are psychologists, psychiatrists, and neuropsychologists uh, who are working um, as a integral part of the team um, to provide those patients who receive the diagnosis of PNES with the treatment as soon as they, as they are um, discharged or as soon as they're given that diagnosis. Well, that's great to hear what you're doing there, and this is maybe an area where the Epilepsy Foundation can help, and we could try to help uh, uh, build that database with you. That would well, be we, great. Uh, well, well, we can talk offline about those options. Um, I'd like to thank both of you for joining us here today for our Ask the Expert series. Um, we've just touched the, the surface of this. There's so many more individual questions. I reworded a number of questions for people, but there are other more detailed ones I'd like to, to have both of you address at a, at a future date. So uh, I will let you both make some parting uh, remarks, and then uh, we will, well, uh, Dr. Salim, how are you? Well, thank you for having us. It's always uh, important to discuss this, and we don't have that many opportunities. My closing comments is that for patients and families who are frustrated, I want them to call the APAs, both of them, the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association, and ask them why there is not more information on this on their patient education websites. Because they should not be getting, getting away with not helping this community. I also wanted to second, um, you know, thanking uh, the Epilepsy Foundation for really organizing this. Uh, there's a tremendous need um, in patients with PNES for information, and the Epilepsy Foundation is an excellent way to uh, to reach many of these patients. Um, I would say, in parting, uh, there is a growing PNES community, um, and for those who are diagnosed with this, uh, to look for. Uh, some of these community groups that uh, are in existence. Hopefully, Salim, myself, and some of the other uh, professionals who are interested in PNES can work with this community um, to uh, give this uh, group of patients a voice. Well, thank you again to, to both of you for joining us today. This is the Epilepsy Foundation's Ask the Expert series, a spotlight on non-epileptic events. Thank you for your attention.